Thank you for joining us this morning. It's live Q&A, beginner beekeeping today. No such thing as a silly question. And right now we're inside a beehive and we're having a look. And just a second ago, I spotted the queen on the lid here, but she might have called back in by now. Let's just have a look around and see if we can spot her. It's like a game of uh, where's, where's Wally or where's Waldo in the US. You're looking for a less stripy, long abdomen, bigger legs, bee, queen bee. See how she's very similar to all the other worker bees, but she's got this shiny back plate. That's often a bit of a giveaway. And notice her movements. It's, she struts instead of the little movements from the other bees. So the queen bee is very important to the hive. There's usually just one queen in a hive and there could be up to 50,000 worker bees and maybe 600 drones or so, which are the males. So we've got the uh, queen here and we want to make sure she's not orphaned from the hive and I just popped the lid open and there she was right on the lid which is a good reason to remember to uh, leave the lid leaning against the hive in case you've missed her on the underside of the inner cover. Later on when you've got your top box on and excluder and all of that then she'll be down below and you won't have to do the check on the underside of the lid so much. There she is look at that we better put her back in the hive, I think. We don't want her orphaned from the hive. So we'll just put the lid over here and let her crawl back into the hive. Now, let's begin a beekeeping Q&A. Each month we dedicate to, there she goes. That's it. <laughs> There's the queen. Each week we dedicate it to beginners and sometimes you're afraid to ask questions, but here we want it to be a place where you're not afraid to ask. We all started off as beginner beekeepers once. No such thing as a silly question. Ask away and I'll try and answer you live. Okay, she's decided she likes me and doesn't want to go into the hive. Here we go, Queenie, into the hive. There we go. Okay, so she's joined the rest of the bees there, which is good. Now this is a swarm we caught exactly a week ago. So let's just have a look at what they're doing. We've got naturally drawn comb in here. We want to do a check to make sure they are drawing nice and straight. So in the bottom box of a flow hive, you've got just wood and wax frames. In fact, they're just a wood frame and the bees build their own wax. So if you have a look here, you can see the comb guide, which is just a little stick at the top and that's all you need for the bees to start drawing comb. Now sometimes they'll start going sideways, so if you're doing naturally drawn comb like this, i.e. you don't have a big plastic or wax foundation sheet, then you do need to check that they're going straight. But once you've gone and crossed over, I used to do a lot of foundation uh, waxing and wiring, but once you've changed over to naturally drawn, it's hard to go back just because it's a whole lot less work and a whole lot more fun in the hive looking at the beauty of their natural comb. Okay, I'm just going to actually leave that one out of the hive. I'll just lean it up there, that's an empty one. And I can set up my shelf brackets as a nice little rest for the frames. So I can do that just by winding out a couple of the screws. Now I'm going to use this little tool that comes with the box just to screw that in a little bit. So we get a nice adjustment for the shelf bracket. Now this is a bit of an odds and ends box. It's been put together with the screws of the old classic, but that's okay. We've just got to make sure we've got it about the right position in order to make this a nice fit like this. And that way it's nice and tight and serves as a great frame rest. And once you've got it set up, they'll stay there for next time. Okay, it is good to put your shelf brackets away though, not leave them there or they're not made uh, to last outdoors like that. So next I'm going to pull out another frame and just have a look at what's going on on the actual frame. So as we move towards the middle we're going to see more activity. This is a brand new swarm from last week and what we're seeing here is what's called festooning bees where the bees actually hang like scaffolding before they start building their comb. So they're doing an amazing work, but what we've got here is a little bit of an issue. 
where the little bit of comb they've drawn isn't in the center. So that's the reason why we're in here to, to check on that and make sure the comb is on the center. Once they get the idea, they usually follow suit. So to get bees off that and ha have a good look at what's going on, then we can just give it a good shake like this. And now you can see that little bit of comb actually isn't on the guide. So it's nice we've caught it early. Now it's such a small piece we could just knock that off or if it was bigger we would um, push it across to being in line. We can have a go at pushing it off but I dare say it will just fall off and the bees can go again. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just push that across. Now it's really white wax showing it's virgin wax that the bees are secreting and using so that it ha when it's browner it's been recycled or well, sometimes it's creamy or yellow. But I doubt we're going to get this pushed across without it falling off. There we go. But I might just push it on like this and see if we can get it to connect. I don't know that we can, but if we could, then it would save the bees a tiny bit of work getting going again. Okay, there we go. You want it in the center like that. Then once they uh, connect to that, um, they will hopefully just continue going straight along the guide. Let's have a look at the other frames and see what's going on further in. So I'm pulling out a frame here, just being very gentle, trying not to squash any bees. Look at that, that's better. Beautiful comb hanging down. Isn't it amazing to look in? I might just uh, shake or brush a few bees away so you can really get a look at what's going on there and see their comb. Beautiful, isn't it? The white virgin wax they're making. And you'll notice that there'll be different cell size. The bees will be sizing the cells for themselves. Now these are a bit bigger than the brood size, which is a 5.3 millimeter cell. And these are coming out towards the six millimeters. And they'll do that when they're further away from the middle of the brood nest for honey storage. And you can actually see the nectar glistening down in the bottom of the cells there. And that's the bees doing their amazing job, collecting their nectar, uh, dehydrating it, and creating their honey. Isn't it beautiful? Okay, we're going to put that one on our frame rest here. Now, we can't get to the other side. Normally I would place it on the other side so you can get a good look with the camera, but not today. So these bees are being nice and gentle. It's not always so, it depends on the genetics. So do protect yourself from stings and, and wear your gloves. Another great example of naturally drawn comb here. Look at that, it's beautiful. They will continue drawing that across. They're doing a great job. And I can see nectar down the cells. What I'm gonna to start to look for though, is to see if we've got any eggs. See if we have a laying queen. We know we have a queen, but just while we're here, we'll have a look for any eggs and just marvel at the world of bees and what they're doing inside the hive. Any questions? Yes, yeah, Cedar, um, got a few people. Michelle's asking, I'm not sure, saying, does the comb stay until the season is over? I, I guess talking about the comb here in the brood box. Yes, it, the bees will keep reusing it and reusing the comb and typically after several seasons of use you want to be cycling those frames out. So each year it's good to move some of the frames from the centre towards the edge so that when it's only honey, which typically is what they do on the edge, you can just pull that out, cut that out and put it back in so they get a fresh start. But the bees will keep reusing and reusing and recycling wax around the hive but it's just a nice idea when it gets really old and dark to start removing some from the hive. Great, thanks. Janelle's asking, um, Seeds, what if it isn't a laying queen? 
It's possible. We saw the Queen, which was great. If you missed that, you can dial back to the start of this live stream. But uh, what we got here is a, is a whole lot of comb to look through and see if we have eggs down cells, which I have just spotted. Now it's going to be hard to, to see that with the camera unless we've got my sister's macro setup. But if you look down the cells here, what you'll see is tiny little grains of rice. Give us a thumbs up if you can see down these cells here. It'd be unlikely if you can see it, but let me know if you can. And down there is like a tiny little grain of rice and that's the bee egg. So we've got a, a healthy swarm catch here. We've got a queen, we've got uh, eggs, we've got honey stores and I can see some pollen stores as well. So these bees are away. In the next few weeks, they'll probably fill up this entire box with comb and be ready for the super to go on and then we can harvest some honey um, after usually a few months goes by and the bees have done their amazing work collecting that nectar and bring it back into the hive. But it all depends on the season. Some seasons just go crazy like right now we've just got so much honey. In fact, I was going to start some harvesting and uh, while we're doing this, we might just harvest a little bit of honey as well. So if, you, if you're new to all of this, the way you harvest honey with our flow hive invention is quite different to conventional. Conventional, you had to take the frames out, take them back to a processing shed, cut the wax capping off, spin them in a, a centrifuge and so on. Here, what we're gonna do is just turn a key-like feature. You can see beneath the bee's feet there, their honeycomb and they've put their wax capping on so we know it's nice and ready. We've harvested a bit from this hive over the, the last uh, few weeks, but they're really bringing it in, so we'll keep harvesting again. So all I'm doing is taking these little caps out, putting the tubes in, I'm going to put uh, the jar underneath like that, and like this. And all we need to do is put this key in the top after taking the little cap out and there's two slots up there I'm going in the bottom one and turning it and what you should see soon is some honey starting to flow down the tube now it's a bit easier because sometimes it's hard to turn the key to just do it in segments so you noticed I uh, went went back to a 90 like this went in again and then turned it again like that and there we go. So what's happening now is channels have formed inside the comb and pretty soon you'll start to see some honey flowing down the tube and into the jar. Here we go. I'm looking right down the tube here and starting to see some honey coming down. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Sometimes it comes fast, sometimes it comes slow, depending on the temperature, depending on how fast the parts are moving because the bees have connected them with their wax and propolis. And, and uh, what's happening now is honey streams are forming all down the frame, which is a beautiful thing. And the honey will literally drain out from beneath their feet and into the jar with very little disturbance to the hive, which was my father and I's effort after a decade was to create a system that allowed you just to harvest honey straight out of the hive like this. And it's so um, amazing to have such success with it and to be able to share it with 100,000 customers all over the world. It's incredible. <laughs> so that's it there. The honey's coming down the tube now. That'll pick up pace over time and we'll see it coming down. We could, um, we could go ahead and harvest another one. Now, that frame there was quite tight actually. I might just leave that key in for a little bit longer to, to let all the parts start to move. And we'll just grab another key. So again, I'm just turning that key bit by bit. If you just wanted to harvest a small amount of honey, you could just go part way in and harvest part of a frame. Or you can go all the way and sometimes you get um, you know, up to here in the jar, other times up to the top. And the other day I actually had the, these jars overflowing, so more than three kilograms of honey per frame. There we go. 
So we're already getting honey streaming down here. This one's racing the other one. It's already uh, halfway down the tube to the jar. I say it's just a couple of people noticing on that those frames. So the ones in the centre, they, they look like they're really full, and yet you've chosen the ones on the outside. Any particular reason for that? Yeah, the reason why is you can. We've been harvesting a lot from this hive, and you can see we've harvested these frames, and these ones we haven't. But I wasn't a hundred percent sure, so I decided to go for the edge ones where I could really see the capping beneath their feet and know that it's capped. So it's important to um, harvest when the bees have capped it. And if you, if you harvest early and uh, it wasn't capped, it's not the end of the world. It just means that honey won't uh, keep on the shelf in the jar. It may go fermented. When the moisture content of honey is above that 20% range, it will uh, tend to ferment depending on the temperature and colony forming units of yeasts and things inside the honey. Well, that might help with Kathleen's question, Seed. She's saying, how long does it take for the bees to dehydrate their honey if the temperatures are in the 70s? Which... Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it, it's more about the humidity. Bees, um, when it's very humid, will, will have a harder time uh, actually getting the honey to get that low moisture content that they want to put the capping on. So in humid climates it'll actually be a little bit slower, usually quick in the first bit because there's lots of things in those subtropical regions flowering, but then s slower to actually get to the capping stage. Okay, back to our hive. Now, must remember we've got an open beehive here, so if the bees do start going for the jars, which are just there, um, we'll put a little wax cover over the top in fact, we might have to do that now. Put a little wax cover over the top. That's one of those kitchen wraps you use to replace, uh, stop any bees, because we've got a whole open beehive here, uh, going and having a little taste of what's in the jar. You don't want them to get a taste for honey instead of flowers because they might get a habit of that and they do what's called robbing, where they'll start robbing honey from other hives instead of creating their own. Okay, let's just have a look at what's going on here on the next frame. So I'm lifting that frame gently up. I can see some nice comb there. That's lovely. So I'm just checking that it's on the comb guide in the center. And any more questions as we go here? For those that are just tuning in, this is a swarm we caught exactly a week ago. And we're just checking that they're drawing nicely on the comb guides because we're using naturally drawn comb here. You see, Steve's asked, um, and, and so is another um, caller as well, saying, got a couple of full boxes of brood um, going really well. Put the super on. Um, but there's, they've put the wax onto the flow frames, but they're still not, you know, putting that honey into those flow frames. Got any good tips for beginner beekeepers? Okay, the biggest tip is going to be patience. <laughs> the, <laughs> um, the, when you get a lot of bees coinciding with a, a, a good nectar flow, then it usually happens quite quickly. But otherwise it'll be quite slow especially that first time they get going on the flow frames. But you've, you've done everything you can, you're just waiting now. Now if you find that you've got one hive that's slow and other hives that are fast, then you might think about the genetics of the hive and wonder whether you need to replace a queen to just get a more virile queen laying more eggs and a stronger colony that can then go and get those flowers and get that honey field quicker. That's typically what a commercial beekeeper would do if their hive's a bit slow, they'd replace the queen. However, you'll find that they will pick up themselves. You've just got to wait till there's a real abundance of flowers present and that will trigger them to breed up and hopefully the flowers keep going and then you'll get lots of good honey stores. If you open the windows of the hive and there's not many bees in there, then they just need to build up a bit first. Okay. Beginner beekeeping questions this morning. If you've got questions, put it in the comments below. 
don't be afraid to ask. It's all about just helping each other learn and helping each other answer those questions that we all had as beginner beekeepers. So it's the, um, you were talking before about those middle frames. How do you check them? Do you need to take the roof off um, to check that they have been capped? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can check them if you want to. We've designed a system so that it, you don't have to check them as uh, all the time. Once you get the hang of it, you can just harvest when you know that the frames are nice and full and you can see the capping. But by all means, get in there and have a look, see what's going on. It's a fascinating world inside your hive and you can just pull the flow frames out and have a look just like we're doing with these frames. Fantastic. A um, lot of rain down in Sydney and on the east coast here in Australia and I guess it's the same what you were just answering before Cedar like um, there's hues down in Sydney and just wanting to make the bees make more honey. <laughs> yeah sometimes the weather can really affect uh, the flow. Uh, a lot of rain can actually wash the nectar right out of the flowers. It can also make the, the nectar ferment. You can get drunk bees coming home. Uh, all sorts of things can happen, right? Because fermented nectar starts to form alcohol. Um, so it is a patience game and sometimes you can get effects where you had a drought and it was a, a significant event that actually affected flowers for uh, two years ahead as well. Up here we've had a couple of poor seasons actually. We've had floods and all sorts of things. Oh, here's the queen bee right here. Whoa and uh, we've also, but now we've got a, a beautiful spring where the honey just keeps flowing in. So sometimes you've got to wait out the seasons to get the really good ones. So you can see it just here, the tip of my finger. She's got longer legs, she's got longer abdomen. Her wings sort of come halfway down her body there. And she's hiding, getting a little camera shy there. Fair enough. <laughs> we might put that frame in rather than leave it out because I don't want the queen to drop off. Surprising with beekeeping how often you actually find the queen on the ground after you've been manipulating a hive and she just drops off onto the ground, which obviously isn't the best place for her because she might not make it back into the hive. When she's in egg laying mode, she often can't fly that well. Though I've certainly seen lots of egg laying queens flying, so it's uh, sometimes the bees don't play by the rule books. But um, the reason why you keep the queen over is she may not make it back to the hive if she's orphaned from the hive. Look at those bees are just festooning on the lid here because I had it leaning on the hive. There's no need to, to get bees off. You can actually even just hit it with your, your fist like this, and the bees just fall right off. Nice. Okay, so I'm going to get that out of the way now because we know the queen's in the box. And let's just have a look at these last two frames. Oh, we're getting beautiful orange pollen on the legs of some of these bees too. You can see one just here. See those big orange balls? The bees have actually gone. Leapt right off the flower onto their body. Their body is completely covered in hairs, even their eyeballs. And then they will scrape those pollen grains back to their hind legs, which are called their pollen baskets, and they'll collect it in those beautiful big uh, balls of pollen. So you get bright orange pollens, whites, blues, creams, browns, reds, and that's what you'll see down the cells. The pollen is their it's their protein source, so they need a varied diet just like we do. Bees will get sick, in fact, if they're just on one type of flower. So just like us, they need a varied diet of protein. Okay, that's the pollen there on the legs. If you have a look, give us a thumbs up if you can see those little pollen grains. There we go, and away she went. Another beautiful example of the naturally drawn comb going really good on the comb guide, which is what we want, and that's what we're checking for. Oh, I've just seen an issue with the next one. We didn't quite do our homework, and the comb guide wasn't glued in place. Let's have a look at what's going on on this frame, and whether it's going to cause an issue or not. Here we go. Oh, look at that. 
So we've got a comb guide that's fallen out of this top slot. So glue it in, or if you're in a hurry, it, use a couple of little nails down the side of it just to secure it. But here we have the bees just not really caring about it. So I'm just going to leave it there because the comb is nice and straight anyway, and the bees are just going to work around it. So they just built off that top bar there, see? Yeah, they've just built off the top bar, which they will do as well. So the comb guide just helps them find centre, but they will just find centre anyway. And this was the frame right on the edge, so it's a surprise. Usually the edge ones, if they're going to go wonky, are the ones that will go wonky first. But this is a really nice straight comb, even though this comb guide's fallen right out of the frame. Let's just have a look at what they're doing right in here. If you have a look, they've, they've brought comb down from the top, connected to it, and then dropped below that again. So they're just using it like a diagonal comb guide in a way. That's pretty cool. Bees will be bees, they're very resourceful, and they'll just use what space they have. Any questions, beginner beekeeping questions today? Yeah, see, so Michelle's asking, are you self-taught or did you go through a program? And, and Steve, um, who's tuning in as well, had said that he'd done our beekeeping course and also um, got, on, got on with a local beekeeper. So people sort of wondering, how did you get into it? So I was self-taught. Um, there's different types of learners in the world. I'm the type of learner that just likes to jump in, get the equipment and go and work it out. Google it if you need to find out an, an answer and just keep learning like that. But th my main, uh, I guess, learning has actually been since we started Flow Hive and it's been from all of you out there teaching me things, which has been fantastic because all of a sudden I'm connected to not just uh, a few beekeepers that I talk to here, but a whole globe uh, sharing their knowledge, which is an amazing community to have. And I've learned so much. And now we've put together the beekeeper.org with experts from all around the world to contribute high quality training material. So if you do want to learn online, then we do have a course that gets rave reviews and it also is a fundraiser. So we're very proud that we've planted a million trees so far and we're gonna keep going to create literally billions of blossoms for our bees to safely forage on. So thebeekeeper.org, have a look at that if you do wanna do some online learning, which is my preferred way to do it because you can just access it quickly when you need it. Uh, but of course, if you do have local beekeepers that you wanna go and learn from, that's fantastic as well. When you can do some learning in person but the way I like to do things is just jump in and learn as you go. Great, so that might lead us into um, we um, want um, a little promo about signing up for people who we're about to start launching our pollinator houses. And people can sign up on the internet um, at honeyflow.com or .com.au, put their name down and be the first up to get the pollinator houses. Ah, yeah, one little project we run each year is we get the upcycled uh, parts of the flow hives, all the offcuts, and we upcycle them into little pollinator houses for our native bees. Now, the whole project uh, is about education. It's about awareness of the 20,000 native bee species in the world. So getting a little pollinator house going is a fantastic little education piece for your family because you can watch the little native bees from your area come and nest in the little bamboo tubes. But it's also good to get out there and just create habitat zones in your yard, plant flowers, leave areas unkept and uh, you, you could make uh, holes in mud if you've got a mud bank or something and that'll help those types of bees that really like to nest in, in holes in mud. And there's all sorts of things you can do to support pollinators because without pollinators, we're in real trouble as a globe actually. So it's not only the European honeybee, which we use so extensively for our agricultural system, but all of the other little native pollinators. And if you start looking around your garden and tuning in, you'll find there's all sorts of ones there that are native to your area. Here we have the blue banded bee that when we first posted that, on our, on our YouTube channel to the world, people thought it was a, a, a fake uh, computer generated blue banded bee because, <laughs> because it's a, a, a bee with bright blue stripes. And uh, we've also got the fire tailed resin bee, the little native uh, TCBs, which do form colonies. 
um, and leaf cutter bees and all sorts of bees that get around in the garden that are really important unsung heroes of our world. So stay tuned into that project. It's this time of year that we release uh, all of the the ones that were boxed up from made from the off cuts of our flow hive. Then we get 100%, actually more than 100% um, of the uh, profits from those and put them towards great habitat protecting um, projects and advocacy for the bees. So it's something our team loves doing each year. Right, and, and um, the fabulous Lee has just popped a little link in this feed as well so you can find out heaps more information and get your name on it because there's not that many and they sell pretty quickly. Lovely. Seeds Bedelia is asking, how long does it take for a new nuke of four frames to fill up all the other frames in your brood box? Uh, it can happen really quickly. So sometimes it, if you're in the springtime particularly and you've got a good nectar flow on, they can fill up a, a box quite quickly. So if you've put half of these frames in from a nucleus, they'll fill the other ones quite quickly if there's a good flow on. But sometimes it can take months and months or in extreme cases they might not even fill them out in a whole season because there just wasn't the resources available or the genetics weren't really uh, virile and they didn't do a whole lot of egg laying. So sometimes it's patience but often it's pretty exciting. This is a swarm we caught last week so in a week they've drawn out sort of half of one, two, three, four, five frames in the box. So they're more than halfway through drawing all of this comb. When they're finished, we'll put the top box on and we'll have another hive to harvest some more honey from. Naomi's asking, Cedar, do you know where that swarm came from? So that, that one, I do know because I had a look and it actually came right from this hive here, which we were going to do some harvesting from as well. And the reason why I know that is because the numbers in here I can see have dropped. If you open the window, suddenly there was less. Now we got in here and we took splits and, and tried to limit the swarming, but we have had a couple of swarms this season. So despite efforts, sometimes they will swarm. And if you're around to catch them, then that's fantastic because you can get another hive going. But this year, uh, more important than ever here in New South Wales to do your swarm prevention We've done about four or five live streams dedicated to that um, spring management, swarm prevention, so that if you do happen to have the varroa mite in your hive, then, you're, uh, then it's not going to spread. So we're trying to contain uh, the varroa mite, which has come in to the port of Newcastle, and uh, there's been a, a huge effort ongoing to try and contain that. Fingers crossed we will. Okay. Right. So the Har Harley's asking, after your first harvest, do you need to clean out the super or just reset it and the bees will continue to do their work? The, um, after, so you simply do just reset it and the bees will continue to do their work. If the frames stay in the hive, the bees will tear off the capping and they will um, actually uh, just recycle that wax around the hive and the whole process will start again. It's quite amazing really. Uh, and it was a stroke of luck that they would do that when, when my father Stu and I were inventing the flow hive. We had all of these crazy contraptions to take the um, uh, capping off inside the hive. And what we found was uh, we didn't need to do that because once the the honey's disappeared from beneath the bees' feet, then you don't really need to um, do anything more. The bees will just get in there, take the wax capping off, repair the cells, and the whole process starts again. So there's very little maintenance of the flow frames. After about five years or so, then they do start getting a little bit, um, uh, if they start getting a little bit grimy, particularly you'll start missing the end frame view looking nice and rosy, uh, then the thing to do is to take them out and use a hot water pressure washer and that does clean them up nicely to go again. So don't throw them away please, we want them to last as long as possible. So if, if you've had them for five years or more and they're, they're really waxy and you really want to clean them up, 
hot water pressure washer, washer you need it about 70 degrees. Wax melt temperature is 63, uh, but 73 is, uh, sorry, uh, 70 degrees or so is where you want to be, is that Celsius, to, to really wash all of that wax away. Um, I should do a post on that actually and show you how to do that. But as I said, they should give you years and years of trouble free um, honey harvesting in your hive. Any more questions? Nice. Yeah, Paul's asking, Cedar, he's got a couple of wild hives on their property. Is it going to be an issue? Uh, are wild hives an issue? The answer is no. It's um, conventionally, uh, well, these are a European honeybee. So in Europe, there's a lot of wild hives and also in, in other countries. Now here, they are something that we keep because they're amazing honey producers and as well, they're really um, important to our agricultural system. So, but what does happen is perhaps swarms get away and as you say, you've got some wild hives. They're not generally an issue. If you are uh, near, in one of, or near one of the red zones in New South Wales, then do let the DPI know. It's important that we find them but um, you should know that already if you're in one of those zones. But otherwise, the wild hives can just exist fine in the trees and things, as they do. In a way, they provide a genetic diversity for us, which um, I believe is a good thing. Right. Johnny wants to know, um, do bees move honey around in the hive? They do. So it, you might find that um, the brood box is full with um, honey and they'll actually move it from the top to the from the bottom to the top to make room for new uh, places to lay eggs for the queen. So yes the bees will certainly move honey around the hive. Okay let's just have a, another look here at this comb just because we're in here and then what we'll do is we'll put the hive back together and be putting the lid back on. They have been apart a while here. There is no brood to speak of yet. However, there is some eggs. We should have a look down some of these cells a bit further. Look at that. It's beautiful, isn't it? To, to witness what the bees are doing. See how they're going. Their white wax is virgin wax, so they've gone foraging, they had no other choice because they're a brand new swarm, but to excrete the wax from their wax glands, manipulate it with their mandibles and form this beautiful hexagon matrix. It's amazing that they can do that as a kind of collective mind. Like if you think about it, one bee will only be creating part of a cell, but yet other bees come along, they know what to do and they will be joining onto the pattern. And they'll be changing from large sized cells to small sized cells and all sorts of things. And it's just this beautiful morph of honeycomb. There's a bee over here doing the waggle dance. Oh, we got a waggle dance. Well done, Callum from behind the camera is uh, telling us about the waggle. Where is it? Give us the thumbs up if you can see that waggle. Now, communication in bees is an incredible thing. The honeybee is the most studied insect in the world and we've actually learnt to decode their dance. And I'm watching that dance and trying to figure out what it's meaning. And it looks like it's the, I thought it was the round dance. The round dance is there's nectar really close, go and get it. Now you can see it's shaking its tail and oh, there's another one that started up there but they do one waggle of the tail for about just under a kilometer of distance, which is something that we can actually decode and work out how far they're flying. But not only that, you can work out in relation to the sun what direction they're going by using the center axis of their figure of eight dance. So, so far we can tell how far they're going and which direction and quite a number of other things just by their movements. In the dark they can dance and tell accurate information 
to the rest of the forager bees to go and find the nectar or pollen source. It's incredible. Amazing. Cedar Duncan's um, about to um, receive first flow hive, so that's exciting later this month. I'm just wondering, a bit apprehensive about starting, but is there any flow hive prep that Duncan should be doing? So that's fantastic. So uh, w when you uh, get your hive, then what uh, you'll need to do is put it all together so you can clear some space on that workbench if you're anything like me. And a drill is handy to have if you don't have one already. It'll speed up the process a lot and make it a lot easier. Some people do put their hives together all by hand, which is impressive, but I, I will always use a drill. It makes it uh, a lot quicker. Um, you could also get your favourite wood to, in order to, uh, to protect that and give it a long lasting wooden finish. So they're made for protecting wood outdoors, so get those decking products from your local hardware store. If you're using the Ara carrier wood, then we really recommend painting that and that'll give you a, uh, a, a long lasting finish outdoors. You can get years out of a good paint coat. In fact, this hive here, which I just took the lid off because there was an ant's nest in there prior, has been painted for, for a number of years and that'll give you a lasting coat on the Ara carrier. I wouldn't recommend using the decking products or the uh, oils on the Ara carrier. You'll get disappointing results with mildew showing through. So getting prepared with your paint is a, a good idea. And also have a look at the beekeeper.org. It's an amazing education program with experts from all over the world, also a great fundraiser as well. So if you really want to sink your teeth into some solid education, it's made to take you from square one right through to even a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. So that could be a great thing to check out as well, but fantastic. Um, I hope you uh, uh, get your hive together well and, and get your bees in it. So that's another thing to do is to start um, organising where you're going to be getting your bees from. So typically there's, there's uh, bee, bee breeders that you can get a new cough or, or a nucleus it gets called. Other ways to start are uh, taking a split from a friend. We've got lots of videos showing you how to do that. And another way is um, catching a swarm, which if you have a look at last week, we'll show you how to do a live swarm catch. Um, do be careful if you're up a tall ladder like I was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was very exciting. Uh, hey Cedar, just on that painted hive, Brady's asking, should they paint it first before they construct it or paint it afterwards and should you paint the inside? Okay, so generally don't paint the inside, or well, we don't, but beekeepers conventionally do. So a conventional beekeeper with a typical uh, radiata pine hive will um, dip the bee box in, in um, basically treated pine uh, formula, then they will paint it inside and out and they'll have a very long lasting box like that. So you can do that if you want to, but we tend to like to keep it perfectly natural for the bees and just leave it wooden on the inside of the box and just paint the outside. So it's really up to you. You won't scare the bees off by painting the inside, so you're welcome to if you want to. Right. Cedar, so can you put the flow frames in the dishwasher? Well, that's a good question. Just <laughs> let me how you go with the dishwasher and your significant other half. Yeah, you may not be popular. <laughs> you may not be popular because all the wax might come off and clog things up. But then again, it might work well. So if you've got an old dishwasher, then try it out. See how it goes. And um, that could be an easier way than getting out the hot water pressure washer. Now, you shouldn't really have to do that very often. In fact, um, they really don't end up uh, grimy unless you've left them around covered in honey and going um, rotten uh, or if you've, you've been using them for five years or more then you might consider taking them out and using a hot water pressure washer or as you say you could try your dishwasher <laughs> but uh, I'll be entertained to hear the results. Cedar, um, Craig and Gwyneth are in Brisbane and they just got the nuke a couple of weeks ago and wanted to check them this week, but Brisbane's a bit overcast with rain forecast in the next few days. 
Is it okay to just leave it or can they have a little inspection with it being overcast? You can certainly have an inspection with overcast. We've got an overcast day here today. Yeah. Um, and it's nice warm weather in your area, so I'll get into it and go for it. So um, just to avoid, you know, if it was raining, I wouldn't be taking the lid off your hive. Um, so having said that, the very best time for beekeeping is mid-morning to mid-afternoon on a nice, warm, sunny day. But often you can't do that. So you'll see us beekeeping when it's windy, you'll see us beekeeping when it's almost rainy, but we won't do it actually in the rain. However, we do harvest honey in the rain because we can do that in this new easy way. <laughs> and uh, conventionally you couldn't harvest honey in the rain, but we can harvest honey in the rain here. Right. Cedar, can you re-oil or paint the hives with the bees still in it? You can. Now be mindful of bees when you're around the entrance side of the hive, wear your bee suit. You might even like to uh, add a bit of smoke to the hive to help calm them. And then the better time to do it is actually earlier in the day before you've got a lot of bees around the entrance. Often early in the morning you've got not a whole lot of um, bees outside the hive so you can even uh, get your oil or your paint coat right across above the entrance there. It's something I have done a lot of actually, um, but you also can uh, do what's called a swap out. You get another box and you put all the bees into another one. You take that one away and you sand it all in the workshop and get it all looking um, tip top again and then put a, a new colony in that one. So if you have the luxury of, of um, having uh, to be able to order another hive, then you can do it that way as well. Uh, Joe said sometimes finds a bit of mould um, in the tray underneath. Just wondering, is there something to prevent it, or is it is it a problem? Now that's perfectly normal to find a bit of mould in the tray underneath. If you think about it, there's debris falling through, there's moisture getting in there. If you've got driving rain, and it's a good uh, habitat for a bit of mould, just clean it out once in a while, and uh, put it back in. It doesn't have to be all clean down there. It um, really is a pest management tray designed for putting oil in there to catch the beetles and also an area where you could put a mite counting board as well or you could turn the tray upside down to do that and to the clean side if you were in, a, in an area that had varroa mites and you could uh, add, add a little bit of um, sticky uh, vegetable shortening on there and use it to count those mites as they fall through the screen. So, it's primarily a pest management tray. You can take it out altogether. Bees will be fine without it in there as well. But um, as said, all you need to do is clean it out every now and then, put it back in. Having said that, make sure you do um, push the cover. Here's one tip. This is the, the cover. And if it's left ajar like uh, out a little bit like that, then you might just find there's a bee gap between the tray under here and the cover, and you'll find bees will get, get into your oil if you're using it as an oil trap. So if it's sitting out like that, that's not so good. So push it in till it actually hits the tray and wind your L screws in so it holds it in there nice and firm. We've got time for a couple more questions. Nice. So it's just on that tray, it's just, just wanted to clarify again what you're putting in it. Is it vegetable oil in, or any type of oil? So we just use cooking oil, just go and get some cheap cooking oil, don't use your, your very best um, extra virgin olive oil, although you can if you want to, um, but we just uh, get some cheap oil and cover the bottom of the tray in that and that works as a very successful beetle trap as the beetles get chased around the hive and fall through the screen into that area. So if bees swarm, will it change their attitude? Um, Brian's asking because maybe that he's saying they were quiet before, so maybe they've become a little bit aggressive. Does swarming change their attitude? Yes, and the reason why is because the genetics of the hive are going to change as soon as there's a new queen. So the old queen leaves and she gets pushed out with half of the bees and they go off and find a new colony. And they typically raise a new one, not all the time, but 90% of the time they'll raise a new one and away they go again. But that 
queen will mate with drones from all around the area. So when she goes on her mating flight, she'll go past the drone congregation area and mate with up to 30 drones in the air. And that will give her sperm for six years of laying. Sometimes she'll do another flight, but usually it's just one or two flights at the start of her life. And, and that's it. So that will set the genetics and the temperament of your hive. So if you find they are a bit aggressive, there's, there's uh, what you need to do is get in there, take the queen away, wait 24 hours, then introduce a new queen into the bottom box here. And if you're in a nice warm climate, when you come back, one thing you can do to put the queen in, she typically comes in a little queen cage, is you can just get your hive tool at the front, lift the box up and slide her in the entrance. So you're just making enough room to slide it in the front to save you getting, uh, taking the top box off a second time. Another little tip there. Right, and Gary's just tuned in from California, getting ready for winter. I know you love those winter questions, Cedar. <laughs> He's just wondering, just remove the flow frames. They're mostly clean with some small remnants and a few drops of honey. Do they need to be completely clean of honey, or is it okay to leave it and just store them over winter? If you're in a really cold climate and your frames are going to stay cold, then that's probably okay. Here we would put them into a deep freeze if we could, and that would keep them perfectly as they are, put them back on again next time your bees are ready for them. Uh, however, if you're, if you're likely to get warm days, then it's best if the frames are clean of any honey, otherwise fermentation uh, can occur. So. Um, if you are going to leave them not in a deep freeze and you are in a warm climate, then you do need to get that honey off. So one of the easy ways to do that is to harvest them, leave them in the open position, don't actually close it, come back, say, a, uh, uh, maybe a, a week uh, later and pull those frames out and they should be nice and clean because the bees would have licked up all of the nectar. If you've just got a little bit in there, you could simply just wash it out, let it dry in the shade, and then store those frames away. If you've stored them with honey on them and it's gone a bit manky and mouldy and so on, then as said earlier, a hot water pressure washer will clean them up and uh, then you can go again. We'd better come back here and put this beehive back together. They've been very patient and uh, their, pro their patience might be wearing thin soon, so we might just uh, close this up. Now, I haven't even bothered to keep my smoker going, so I'm going to just gently move the frames together because we do need to put them back together so the spacing's correct for the naturally drawn comb. That's another great tip, is when you are doing naturally drawn comb, you do want, uh, if I had a bit of smoke here, they'll clear out from where the end bars are. There's really not much smoke coming out, but it might be enough just to uh, clear them away so I can close these end bars without squashing any bees. Now, here we go. Okay. Out of the way, that's it. Good, so what we're doing, pushing them all together so we can just um, get the spacing right for the bees. And once we've done that, we're just going to put the lid back on and away we go again. I could light the smoker again, but I hardly need it with this colony. They're so calm, aren't they, Cedar? And then the, and they the are queen so calm. keeps showing her face. In fact, I've forgotten to put my bee veil back on. <laughs> which only do that when you're very uh, comfortable with bees. Start beekeeping by uh, wearing your bee suit and your bee gloves and really get yourself comfortable first. So we have got another frame here on this edge and we've got one here. Let's just put these frames back in and see how we go. Pushing them over. And the last one, another tip is keep the excess space on either side. So that's a good way to remember when you push your frames back together, you want any space 
that you can see down the side here to be on the edges. Now there is a generous, generous uh, amount of space in our boxes. You will appreciate that later as time goes on. So it makes it a bit easier as the frames all get waxy. Come on, out of the way. Out of the way, you little bees. One more question. Um, oh look, I've got to ask this one because this is Finn's coming from New Zealand, where I'm from, so I better ask Finn's question. How can I safely keep a hive queenless for six days? Are there any measures I can take to prevent laying workers or other problems? Okay, safely keep a hive queenless for how many days? Six days. Six days waiting for a queen, so yeah. you must have ordered one. Yeah. Um, well, you can't really know for sure what's going to happen. Um, so your options are introduce a frame of brood from another hive that has eggs on it and they might raise their own queen but because you've probably ordered one then you may as well just wait it out and hopefully they will take to the new queen. But as you say there is a, an issue that can occur by waiting too long where a hive becomes hopelessly queenless, it gets cold, where they won't accept a new queen and you keep putting one in and they, they keep knocking her off and for whatever reason they get into a bit of a pattern and they slowly die out. If you've got a hopelessly queenless hive, what I tend to do with it is merge it with another colony. To do that, you get your brood box, sheet of newspaper on top of your other hive. So you take the roof off, take the inner cover off, sheet of newspaper, and just plonk it directly on top. It can be on top of the super, it can be on top of the prude, it doesn't matter. And they'll slowly chew through and merge and their pheromones will mix and you get less fighting by using the uh, newspaper method. Next I'm going to put the inner cover straight back on and close these bees up. Thank you very much for being so friendly for our show and tell. And we'll look after them and they should grow quite quickly and then we can put a super on top. Thank you very much for watching and, and have a look at thebeekeeper.org if you do want a, an extensive online training course with lots of amazing uh, training videos from experts from all over the world. Thank you very much for tuning in.